Hello, everybody. My name is Carl Blythe. I'm the director of CORAL, the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning, coming to you from the University of Texas in Austin, Texas today. And we are celebrating this week Open Education Week 2017. Uh, we have a really great webinar planned today. We have a number of speakers who are going to be talking about how they are opening up their own language classroom through the creation of uh, their own OER. Um, so let me just introduce the names. We're going to be pretty informal. I've asked them all to um, prepare their statements, but to keep it conversational and informal. So we have Megan from uh, Parkway School District uh, outside of St. Louis, Alexia, Sonia, and Colleen, uh, three colleagues working together uh, in the Spanish department in George Mason University in Northern Virginia, just outside DC. So um, we're very happy that we are going to uh, hear from people in public school, secondary education, as well as higher ed, because at Coral, uh, as part of the Department of Education, we're focusing uh, on the entire ecology, that is K through 16. So um, you might have seen this uh, image, open edge, celebrating Open Education Week. And the point I want to make here is that this is a movement. It's a worldwide movement of educators who are trying to overcome barriers and obstacles that we find in the way education is structured or the way education is delivered. Uh, in, in essence, we're trying to open up education by giving people better access to the materials, to the scholarship, sometimes even to our courses themselves. Unfortunately, what we're finding is that education in many parts of the world is pretty much a closed system. And even in the United States, it is shutting down and keeping people out. So open educators, essentially, people just like you, are trying to combat these, these problems, these issues. And they're joining with each other. It's a collaborative enterprise, teaching each other uh, different ways, different practices to overcome these obstacles. And that's exactly what we're going to hear from these speakers today, what they're doing, kind of a do-it-yourself movement to overcome the, the problems that they've encountered. So let's get started. Uh, first of all, CORAL. I have to say a couple words about CORAL, the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning. We are one of 16 national foreign language resource centers. And we are um, funded by the Department of Education, the U.S. Department of, of Education. Uh, we are in a grant cycle that started in 2014 and that will end in 2018. And we, as I mentioned, are located here at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, there are LRCs, Language Resource Centers, from the East Coast to the West Coast and even including Hawaii. So there's 16 of us all across the nation. Our mandate, our mission, is to increase the foreign language capacity of the United States. We do that through the lens of open education. And I should mention here, the bullet point says that we are the only Department of Education Title VI Center, which includes national resource centers focused on area studies, such as Mexican American studies, European studies, East Asian studies, et cetera, as well as the 16 LRCs. There are hundreds of them. We're the only one doing all this in open education. So um, let me begin by saying that I think we are in a crisis in education, and the crisis is getting actually worse and worse. The crisis really is about, uh, you've heard about how tuition is going up and the price of education is skyrocketing. But I want to take just a minute to focus on the issue of pedagogical materials. Uh, in American higher education, uh, the average annual cost of, of materials is $1,300 per student. Now, that's the average. That's really significant, especially for uh, people who, uh, who are first time, uh, first in their family to go to college, maybe from lower income brackets, and they don't have that kind of money saved to pay for textbooks. We also know that um, various surveys have shown that many students actually drop a class once they find out how much the textbooks cost. Up to 50% of the students are doing that. And we also have evidence that many students are not buying the textbook. Or maybe they go in with a number of other students and they're sharing the textbook. The point is, in higher education, we've hit a tipping point. Textbooks are really expensive. And they're, um, they're affecting graduation rates. They're affecting enrollment. 
um, and students are looking for ways to get around that. And in the public schools and secondary education, it's actually, um, there's a crisis there as well, because during the Great Recession that started, let's say, in 2008 and 2009, there were severe textbook um, cuts, cuts to, to the educational budget by most states. And here we are almost 10 years later, much of that funding has not been reinstated. And what we have, of course, are, are teachers in classrooms who simply don't even have textbooks. Either they don't have the textbook or they only have, they have too few textbooks to go around and the textbooks are, um, are, are soon outdated. So let me define open ed. It's a collective term that refines to form, that refers to forms of education in which knowledge, ideas, or important aspects of teaching methodology or infrastructure are shared freely over the internet. That's what we're doing today. And of course, the, the, the problem was uh, pedagogical materials, and we're gonna look to OER to rescue us. The term OER uh, was coined in 2002 during a U UNESCO meeting. And it simply refers to any educational material offered freely for anyone to use, typically involving some permission to remix, improve, and redistribute. Let me give just a little bit of information from our participants. And I'm gonna ask that you fill out a couple of these polls here. So the first poll is, uh, what is your role? Are you a student or a teacher or administrator? And What's your educational level? That's where, where are you in the uh, educational system? What language do you teach? If, if you teach a language. And you can just type in your answer there. And then finally, what kinds of materials do you create? Um, you may have never created something or you buy, um, you've already created activities or lesson plans, whatever. So I'll just give you a minute to take a look at that, uh, to complete our poll here. I see that the roles seem to be, there are, we have an administrator, we have uh, teachers. So most of you, of course, are teachers. Uh, I'm glad to see we have a student. Educational level is split. We have mainly higher ed, but a good representation K through 12. And then we have many different languages represented. That's great. And finally, activities. Um, everybody at some point in, in their teaching career comes up with an activity lesson plans, larger units, uh, different forms of assessment, so everybody makes some kinds of a quiz, uh, an, a curriculum, an entire curriculum or a course that's much more ambitious. Uh, same is true, of course, as a textbook. Okay, but the point is that people certainly do have some uh, experience and some expertise in creating these materials. These, of course, are do-it-yourself enterprises, and that's exactly what we're gonna hear from our, our speakers today. From, we'll, we'll start off with a secondary, um, a, a story from a Parkway School District. So they are developing their own curriculum, as it says here, trying to incorporate three modes of communication and striving for linguistic proficiency. And they're facing a lot of growing pains, and I've asked her to talk about those growing pains and uh, how they're trying to incorporate best practices, authentic materials, but importantly, how to get collaboration to work among faculty within our district and outside. So, Megan? Take it away. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for including me. Um, I wanted to give you a little backstory on Parkway and how we have ended up in the um, position that we are in. Uh, there was a group of nine of us who were department chairs in 2015 that were sent to Actville by our district. Um, and that was, that was a huge undertaking for our district to pay for all of us to go to Actville. Well, we heard the work of Laura Terrell and Donna Clementi, and we decided, Laura Terrell being a former Parkway employee uh, and leading us, we decided to have her consult us because we wanted to create thematic units. And so we came back and we decided, okay, it's, it's April, it's time to start thinking about next year, it's time to start thinking about our curriculum, and how can we do this? And we were in the middle of a textbook adoption and we had looked at textbooks, we had thought we had them picked out, but as we were forming our thematic units, uh, we decided, okay, this isn't working for us. We, we can't find um, a textbook that really supports our curriculum, and our district is very firm on making sure that the curriculum is written before adopting resources, and that only makes sense. 
So we found that our curriculum wasn't fitting the mold of any textbook. So there enters the first problem. So we knew that this was going to be ambitious. We knew that this was going to be a huge undertaking. We didn't roll it out as soon as we would have liked to. Uh, we worked feverishly over the summer, this past summer, trying to develop materials um, and you know pulling things from OER and different resources that we had. And we just still weren't feeling very right about this. We're very much still novice um, uh, users with OER. But this past fall, we went to ACTFIL, and um, I'm the facilitator of modern and classical languages, and my coordinator and I, um, Amy Belding, went to ACTFIL, and we met up with Sarah Sweeney of CORAL, and we were able to um, talk with her and hear the message from others about how the resources out there are better than anything that we um, you know, we could we could take what we created, we could put it out there for people to use, and we could in turn take their resources, tweak them, and make them better. And you know, I guess the big take-home message for us has been that a textbook is outdated the minute that it that it comes to print, and OER is not. There's constantly new resources out there, so much so that we have found that as we are creating these thematic units. And we're in full-blown implementation mode. We've been using thematic units all year with no textbook. We've actually found how freeing it is to not have a textbook and not be locked down to um, a text. So that being said, it's also been a very scary road because we began to look at online resources and we began to implement those online resources and OER into our curriculum for listening activities, for interpretive activities, both listening and reading. Um, it just, just a plethora of, of information was out there, so much so that one of our uh, challenges has been that it's, it's overwhelming to, it's overwhelming to sift through all this information. And so we've really had to sit down together and collaborate. We have a thematic unit writing team have um, worked together in numerous small groups and language groups and our PLC groups and we've really just hammered out this curriculum using OER and using what we know is good practice with the three modes of um, communication and so it has not been an easy task we have definitely run into some challenges uh, with people I'm, I'm responsible for um, creating our Google Drive with our curriculum and we put everything on Google Drive so that it is collaborated, it's shared with everyone in our district. We have probably about 50 foreign language teachers, modern and classical languages teachers. And the problem is, is that um, we find that people, you know, they, they take the information, they're happy to receive it, they're very forgiving, um, they understand that it's not perfect, they understand that they can make it better, but boy, are they scared to put it out there for themselves. So to share that information, even just within our own district with each other and our colleagues. And so we've had lots of courageous conversations about making yourself vulnerable um, and, uh, you know, the boomerang effect that if I put it out there, that it's probably going to come back to me better than it started, or I hope it does, and just knowing that things aren't going to be perfect the first go around. So. We've learned a lot. We've learned a lot by giving up a textbook. We've learned a lot by sifting through materials. We've learned a lot about ourselves and our curriculum all through using OER. And Corel has been a huge help, a huge help with their compilation of materials. Um, we, do, we use a lot of your materials for our listening activities, um, for our interpretive assessments and such. So, um, you know, it's definitely been, we've had growing pains. Um, we've had we've had lots of um, very heated, emotionally charged conversations about um, best practice and shifting responsibility to the teacher. And it's it's really been a um, it's been a challenge, but at the same time, it's been incredibly rewarding to sit back and say, "Okay, I created this." And it's better than any textbook because I know my kids better than a textbook does. 
and I know their needs um, and I know their proficiency level. So that, that part has been really cool. Um, I know I talked very, very quickly, and so I'm just wondering if there's any questions. The question is, what do you say to teachers who don't think that this is part of their role? We've had that. We've had numerous teachers say, you know, when I went into teaching, I didn't sign up to um, be a curriculum writer. I signed up to be a teacher. And we have kind of taken the approach that, um, you know, we've started with our department chairs. And little by little, we have gotten people to come on board with us um, to drink the Kool-Aid, if you will. Um, we've had talks with administration. We've had talks with department chairs. We've had talks with PLC leaders. And so we were able to, we were able to then, um, you know, come together and say, listen, we know that you are not a curriculum writer. However, you are um, an integral part of our, of our system, of our district, and we know that you are capable of awesome things. And so we really need your help in supporting our curriculum and doing what's best for students. And so we've been able to, um, to do that. Um, which Coral OER were helpful? Um, so uh, we have used all of the online resources. And I would have to look at my bookmarks. I have it bookmarked um, as to which have been the most helpful. Our division of labor has been kind of interesting. We have been able to use um, we have been able to use a group of PLCs, and we have been able to use a thematic unit writing team, and we have been able to recruit people who want to do this work outside or who are passionate about this work more so than just the average teacher. You know, there's different seasons in life. We have parents of young children who teach with us. We have um, people close to retirement. There's just all different walks. And so we have been able to tap our resources and um, get the people who are passionate about um, OER and are passionate about our curriculum and thematic units and write this, write these units for us. But it's definitely been, um, you know, we've, we've had everyone on board because you just can't tackle a task this big and not have buy-in from everyone. Um, and so that's been that has been um, very, very difficult. So will we be open? That's our hope. We definitely hope that we will be open. And we definitely hope that we will be sharing our um, materials with others. We have uh, created a thematic units summit <clears throat> where we will be discussing uh, different, we'll have different sessions. And that summit will be with two other districts in the St. Louis area, uh, Ladue, and uh, Rockwood, Rockwood School District and Parkway. And so the three of us will get together and we will have a thematic unit summit in July. We have had, I saw a question come up about homeschool groups. Have I had homeschool groups contact us? We have not, but man, that would just be actually phenomenal because all of the resources we have could be used given that we don't have a textbook. Um, we do have parents that will say, OK, now that you don't have a textbook, how do I help my kid? How do I help them study? And so uh, we have had to kind of retrain parents and retrain our teachers or reframe how they say things. Um, you know, our vocab lists are all encompassing, our can-do statements, our IPAs. And we use those as our building blocks of our curriculum. And we guide all of our parents and students to those. Um, let's see. If so, what kind of feedback did they give after using it? OK, so um, we, yes. So homeschool, I, we have not yet had any groups ask for our materials, but I would welcome that. I think that would be great if they could. And, um, and so yes, now the Parkway School District does use, we use our own curriculum. We will not be adopting a new text this year. Uh, I, I think there is a very, very, very small group of teachers in my district who would like to potentially still have a textbook as a resource. And we're not saying that a textbook is a dirty, ugly word. Um, however, it's just that they become outdated. The materials aren't authentic. You can find so many great authentic materials on OER and with Coral. And so 
there's just so many great things out there. Pinterest has been a huge help to our teachers. And, um, you know, if it comes down the line that there is a textbook that supports our curriculum, then we will definitely look at um, investing the money in those resources. However, right now, um, our teachers are saying, you know what, I've taught with it. I've taught without a textbook this whole year. I haven't missed it. I haven't needed it. Um, I, I don't find them worthy. And why spend all this money on them when they become outdated so quickly? So we can definitely keep up with the times and keep up with our student needs much better using OER. Then the coolest part is that um, I have been looking at the TEL framework and I will be at TEL Collab this July. Um, uh, July 24th through 26th in Austin. I'm so excited. And um, Coral, Coral is doing um, some fabulous things uh, hosting the event. And I'm so excited to come and learn from this conference. And so I'll be interested to see if anyone there will be, um, or if anyone from the webinar will be there too. Um, okay, so from Joshua, given the digital nature of many OER, have you encountered any technolo technology related hurdles, issues in your school district, either for students and or your foreign language instructors? Okay, through the process. Yes, that's a great question, Joshua. So one of the problems that we have noticed is that um, infographics and such that we pull are blurry or they're too small or the print is too small and we can't make it bigger. And so next year, um, we are going to be piloting level two thematically. Um, and that group of teachers has been promised uh, a class set of Chromebooks for each of their classrooms. We are also, in our middle schools, going one-to-one -one for Chromebooks. So we are excited that we will not have some of those technological hurdle, hurdles. And, um, and I think that that's, that's going to be a really cool thing. That's going to be very powerful to incorporate technology with OER and with our students and our faculty. So I think my time's up and I appreciate you listening and I can't wait to hear from the other speakers. Thank you so much, Megan, that was terrific. And um, thanks to all the people who've sent in questions. I like how this is much more um, spontaneous. I'm glad that we were able to date. We were planning on taking some of the questions at the end, but you know, questions arise as you're speaking. So thanks very, very much. So let's move on to our next group of speakers from George Mason University, Alexia, Sonia, and Colleen. And uh, again, they're coming from the Spanish department and they also have a really ambitious kind of OER project. So I'll turn it over to the three of them. Hi, so I'm Colleen Sweet. I'm a teacher in the Spanish program and also the undergraduate advisor here at George Mason University for the Department of Modern and Classical Languages. And um, I'm going to be presenting Lisa's slide today, um, which kind of talks about what led us to the creation of OER materials and what inspired us to start this project. One of the things that we found was it was very similar to what to the experience that Megan described with trying to find textbooks that fit our curriculum. Um, specifically, we were looking for textbooks that were appropriate for our um, first level of courses in the sequence for the Spanish minors and Spanish majors. So we have about 50 Spanish majors, about 75 Spanish minors, um, and um, several students who take our basic language, um, basic 100-200 uh, level Spanish courses at Mason. And when we did our search for textbooks, we found that several just didn't fit with what we needed students to be able to do to be successful in our Spanish program. So the textbooks lacked cultural content that was interesting, that was up to date, um, that you know helped them develop critical literacy skills and critical and a critical approach to cultural studies um, in order to be able to be successful in the advanced level courses in writing and stylistics, linguistics, and cultural Latinx studies that they would be taking later on. Also, the textbooks that we did find were prohibitively expensive for our students, and we just didn't feel it was worth it to adopt a textbook that, um, that wasn't going to fit our needs and that was going to be so expensive for our students. Um, so we started reviewing existing OER for the Spanish classroom, and we found a lot of resources. We found a few that were appropriate for our specific course sequences. Um, so we didn't find enough course, um, resources that were pairing cultural readings and a critical approach to cultural content 
with um, grammar, vocabulary review. What we try to do in these courses is address culture um, while also helping students um, improve their proficiency in reading, writing, speaking, and listening. So grammar is um, and uh, structure and vocabulary is um, approached in context. Um, so we applied for and were awarded a Mason 4VA grant to develop OER to replace the textbooks that we would have been using. So instead of inducting textbooks in fall 2016, we started working on the materials. So now I'm going to turn things over to Sonia, who's going to talk to you a little bit more about what the experience of creating the materials was like. Yeah, I will start saying stop criticizing, start working, right? So, and our collaborative work that also we can call it co-creative work has uh, three important uh, points in the foundation. We can say that our co-creative work rests on three main pillars. First, our intrinsic motivation and our pedagogical experience. Second, our diverse academic training and teaching goals that find common ground in the materials we create for our students. And the unique readings envisioned as open educational and resources of motivation. Those readings are the materials that uh, we created. We started creating writing uh, for our students. And um, that motivation, in Lisa's words, is a motivation to gain new knowledge on the experiences of Spanish speakers with whom we share the Americas. In Alexia's words, that motivation is to embark on a journey of discovery and appreciation for another language and its culture. This motivation in Colleen words is a motivation to continue on their Spanish studies and develop their critical thinking skills. And on my own words, that motivation is to appreciate the linguistic richness of the Spanish language that exists both outside of the United States and within this country. And if this slide caught your attention, probably the picture is doing its job, as it does in one of the lessons of our OER project. We, can we created so far, uh, thanks to this co-creative work, as you can see in this main map, two groups of uh, lessons. The first group that corresponds to span 305, and it's, uh, we have there five lessons. And for span 36, we created four lessons. Um, let me just uh, take a moment to talk a little bit about lesson four as an example of the other lessons. Lesson four, that is, uh, the title is Music and Dictatorship in Latin America, has several sections. Uh, we created pre-reading activities. Then we have the, the reading per se, which has several sections. And of course, a bibliography. Then after that reading, we have a vocabulary list and post-reading activities. Everything was created for us, for this team. And uh, as an example of those exercises, if you want to explore later, uh, we put the vocabulary in uh, using the Quizlet platform. And we do more or less the same structure that you have seen here with this lesson four, for every lesson. And uh, in, uh, this was, uh, um, and uh, my colleague Colleen will uh, talk a little bit about what the experience is in classroom using these materials. 
Thank you, Sonia. So yes, I kind of joined the team a little bit later um, in fall 2016. I just happened to be assigned the, the Spanish 305 course. And to just give you a little bit more context about these courses, um, with the Spanish in Context course, as I mentioned before, they're the first course that students take in the minor and major. Um, and so the idea is students take the first part of the sequence in the fall, the second part of the sequence in the spring. Um, we have a lot of diversity here at George Mason University in, in all of our classes and in our Spanish classes we have, you know, a combination of students who come in as freshmen who took AP, Spanish, scored an appropriate um, score on the AP exam and start at the 300 level to students who are junior seniors who follow the whole sequence from 100 level. Um, there's a lot of diversity in age ranges as well, from 17 year olds to people over their 70s. Um, and we also have a good mix of students who are learning Spanish as a foreign language and who are learning Spanish as heritage learners or heritage speakers of the language. So there is no real typical 305, 306, 309 student. Um, ideally, the students who would take this class would be students who are taking Spanish as a foreign language because we have um, a curriculum in place for heritage learners, but that's not always the case. Many of our students work um, or have families, and so they have to take the classes at the, at the schedule that's appropriate for them. So that means that our resources have to kind of address a, a range of fluency levels um, and also be relevant to people from a lot of a wide range of experiences. Um, another challenge that I thought about when I was preparing to teach with these OER materials was um, my approach to technology in the classroom and um, what was the level of digital literacy that my students had, how comfortable am I with technology, and also how comfortable am I going to be letting them use devices in the classroom. So in our case, we used Blackboard platform to share our OER materials with our students. Um, and that's a, a technology that all students are at Mason are pretty familiar with and use pretty regularly. So it certainly made it helpful, but um, it meant having to be open to letting students access their devices all the time in class. So I had to kind of rethink how I was gonna approach that. Um, so some of the strategies that I tried to use to address these challenges was to, first of all, tell students from the beginning that um, our texts were gonna be OER materials and to communicate with them from the syllabus and from the first day of class, what my expectations were gonna be um, for how they could prepare for class. We also took some time to talk about accessing devices and using technology in class and what was appropriate and what was inappropriate. And also what kind of resources are good resources for students of Spanish. Um, what's a good dictionary, why you have to um, you know, stay away from babble fish and use word reference instead, for example. Um, and uh, so I think that was really helpful. I also tried to model that using those resources in class when it came up. Um, another thing that was really helpful was that the format for the readings was very consistent. So students, once they got used to the first reading and the second reading, they knew what was expected of them, how to prepare vocabulary, how to read, how to do the questions. One thing that we tried to do to incorporate a practice of grammatical accuracy was, and also to continue the conversation about culture because it's one of the advantages we have with having students with such a wide range of experiences in our classes is um, was creating um, engaging expansion activities for students so they could do research outside of class about an, a part of the topic that was particularly interesting to them and then come back into class and share that. So one example was um, an oral homework assignment they had to do for the, the lesson four that Sonia um, explained um, to you earlier. And so I asked students to research a song that corresponded to a, a certain type of political or social context. So it didn't necessarily have to be a song about, um, you know, written in the context of a to, uh, dictatorship or totalitarian regime, which was the, the unit we were covering, but songs that kind of address different topics related to like social protest. And it was really interesting to see what the students brought in. Um, they were interested in songs about uh, the cost of education in Spanish speaking countries, for example. Um, a lot of them brought in songs by Juanes um, and all the different themes that he covers. So um, it gave them a chance to practice using their Spanish, to do a little bit of research, and also kind of talk about something that they like, which um, helped them have a positive attitude when it came to having to talk in front of the class. Um, another thing that I think was really helpful was that I had access to technology enhanced classrooms. So I had a computer and a projector and a screen, and, that, and I never had any issues with technology. Um, and so that really helped me um, use these resources successfully. 
Uh, and finally, we were always able to kind of check back in with each other and talk about our experiences. So although I hadn't been involved in the original creation of the materials, I was able to come back to Sonia and to Alexia and talk to them about what I tried to do, how I tried to teach um, the unit, or like how we did the vocabulary, and share with them some of the, the activities that worked really well. So um, I'm going to now turn things over to Alexia, who's going to talk to you a little bit more about the lessons we've learned from our experience with this project. Uh, thank you, Colleen. Uh, as my colleagues have just described, going OER redefines the learning and teaching experience. The entire process is pedagogically enlightening and motivating. It provides the opportunity to approach material in an engaging manner. Uh, for our team, redesigning and teaching two content-based upper-level Spanish, Spanish courses uh, with OER has been an, an enriching experience from which we have drawn uh, the following recommendations that you have on the two last uh, PowerPoint slides. Uh, before going OER, we believe that it is crucial to get some training on the best practices of using OER and digital resources. Our university's librarians and Mason Publishing Group did guide us through part of the process. Also attending professional development events such as conferences, seminars, workshops, Training sessions or panel discussions is a great way to gain insights and new skills, gather innovative ideas and tips, exchange ideas, meet peers working on similar projects, etc. Such events can also be highly motivating and inspiring. Uh, my uh, colleague Sonia had the opportunity of participating in the two-day Corel workshop offered last summer. Um, for um, teachers of heritage learners of Spanish, and it provided her a valuable no it provided her valuable knowledge for using OER in her courses, as well as new approaches in teaching Spanish for heritage uh, speakers, and most importantly, motivated her in taking an active role in our course redesign project. It is also crucial to understand what you're allowed to do according to the OER copyright. Many resources will be licensed with Creative Commons, but be aware that not all of them can be reused and remixed. If you're not familiar with the uh, these copyright license licenses on the Creative Commons website, uh, you'll find information regarding the six different types of licenses. Uh, as Megan said, mentioned in her presentation, there is a plethora of open educational resources available online and um, they may be overwhelming. Um, probably you will not have trouble locating them, but you may have a hard time evaluating them. It is critical to evaluate them for accuracy and quality, and for that you can use the Achieve OER, OER rubrics, and um, the link is on the PowerPoint presentation. Remember, quality does matter. Uh, we also rec recommend you to opt for gradual transition to OER. Uh, you could start by, by incorporating your course uh, a few OER, such as audio recordings, podcasts, full digital text, images, um, interactive activities, or slideshows before going fully OER. Um, also, in reusing, revising, rem remixing, or creating OER, Keep in mind that the um, keep in mind the needs and abilities of your prospective students. You should therefore maintain clear goals and expect expectations as you would do for any other courses. Uh, it is known that variety adds spice to teaching and learning. Hence, strive for diversity by incorporating OER in a var in a variety of formats. For example, such as the ones I have mentioned uh, a few seconds ago. Also, something that is very important, reflect and uh, reflect on and measure the impact of your or your courses and engagement, performance, achievement, and success of your, of your students. After each class session, think about what went well, what can be improved, and what are the main takeaways from each activity completed during class. Do not wait until the end of the semester for your students to evaluate your OER courses and give you feedback. Early course evaluations and midterm evaluations to assess the material, the method of de de delivery, and so on uh, have many benefits. 
uh, they can let you know if you need to make adjust adjustments to your courses. Um, and students feel also uh, empow empowered to, kill, um, to help design their own educational process. Um, also very important, look for support from others, from, uh, for example, your colleagues, other uh, educa educators working with OER, uh, your college, uh, university or school librarians can be extremely supportive in your endeavors. Why not work in collaboration with colleagues or, colleague, uh, or a colleague? And <clears throat> your students can be a tremendous source uh, for ideas and improvement listen to them, ask them for continuous feedback, make them part of the process, consider empowering them to create content as well. On my slide, uh, my last recommendation is to consider publishing the material you have created um, or the OER you have re revised or remixed. Um, I have uh, listed two websites where you can do that. Um, and by doing so, you will help in maximizing the use and availability of your open education, educational materials, enhance your reputation as an educator, and most importantly, be part of the OER social responsi responsibility of providing education for all. So I hope you will all consider taking part of the OER initiative. It will give you more freedom to create and or redesign your courses, put to work your creativity, um, also increase your students' engagement and motivation, and last but not least, be part of the OER initiative. Thank you guys so much, the entire team at George Mason University. And just like we did with Megan, I wanna give people a chance to write questions. Uh, what's on your mind as you've heard them describe their process of creating materials for their students? Uh, what kinds of issues did they encounter? And we have a first question, Pilar is asking, are your materials available to everyone? Okay, so you've started with your, you've created all these great materials, but, and they are available to students at George Mason, but are you putting them on the internet and sharing them? Well, as Colleen stated, for the moment, we place everything on Blackboard, but very soon we'll be plan we're planning to do so during summer. So yeah, we wanted to test it out first and see how it worked in two semesters, and then we will be making it available this summer 2017. Yeah, that's that's probably a reasonable way to go about this. Play around with it at your own institution and then share it. Um, I wanted to kind of ask the group then, uh, Megan said that um, many of her teachers felt that, felt that this was kind of a vulnerable activity or they felt like it was face threatening to create materials and share it with your colleagues. Did any of you have those kinds of experiences? Did you feel like um, you were a little bit reticent? You didn't want to share with other people? Sonia says that she's very brave. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. I think we all really, um, you know, for the creation of materials, I think people drew on their expertise that they already had. So addressing sociolinguistic diversity in the um, OER text that Sonia Balash created the first lesson one for, for 305, for example. And we all we have a diverse range of experiences, so we all just drew on what we already know. Um, and so, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, that, I mean, certainly having teamwork, having collaborators that you get along with and you're working together on something, that Definitely. probably reduces the feelings of vulnerability and saving face and all of that. So that's an important yes, point. Uh, yeah, and yeah. that we are brave, remember. Yes, you are brave. I mean, everybody's brave to, to, to actually tackle this and to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think um, sometimes the what I was trying to open with at the beginning was that these issues are making us braver because sometimes we don't really have other alternatives. We're looking for, we're creating the alternatives ourselves because they're, the good ones aren't out there. So you have to be brave and you have to just do it. Yes. Yeah. So here's a so, question. Um, Tracy is asking, will you be creating OER for other levels, for lower level courses? So in the different levels, I mean, that's all, have other people, other colleagues at George Mason who teach different levels, are they going to take 
take over your ideas and expand this in the curriculum? Well, hopefully, and this is what we may do in the future. So not yet, but hopefully soon. Um, I think level 300, 400 level courses are, go without textbook already anyway. Um, but for the 100, 200 level, let's hope for sometimes. Well, that's a good point. A lot of the lower level language courses typically have an adopted textbook created by commercial publishers. And then in higher ed, when they take so-called content courses, um, professors are much more adapt. They're, they're, they're used to choosing their own materials or creating something on, on a Blackboard or, or Canvas or what, whatever the LMS is. But they're not used to sharing them with the world. So that's the difference. I mean, mm -hmm. what we see from uh, at the very beginning of, of this webinar, when I asked people to fill out just a little bit of information, it's clear that people are creating materials. All teachers create lesson plans and activities mm -hmm. and quizzes and so forth. But they don't go to the next step. And I think that's sharing. And Megan said something, I, I wrote it down. She called it the boomerang effect. What you give out to the world comes back to you. And sometimes it comes back to you and it's better. So you have an idea um, that you work, you've you worked out with your classroom and then you share it with somebody who gets inspired and can add on something and it comes back to you. So I think that people in upper level content courses are used to creating their class, but they don't share. And that's really what we're trying to get people to do, talk about sharing during open education week. So yeah. Um, so I'm talking just to kind of tap dance here to see that there are more questions in the chat room. I see people are, are, are typing. Any other? Um, I will say as people are typing their questions, I wanted to make a comment. I thought it was really nice um, that you were, as part of your OER, you were actually embedding certain kinds of practices, what, what we would call an open educational practice. For example, you gave the, the, the example of having your students as part of the lesson search for music that responds, that, that is itself a kind of, um, I don't know, a social protest. So you empower the students to use uh, digital resources in a new way and you incorporate, you incorporate the actual practice of a Google search into your materials. I thought that was a terrific, because the whole point uh, of creating OERs is we're, we're trying to to oblige our students, to teach our students by example. So I thought that was a terrific, terrific idea. You're modeling open educational practices. So in every, in Actful, and everybody's talking about how we want to teach languages and promote 21st century foreign language skills. So that's great. You can do that really well with OER. I think that's one, one thing that's important is encouraging students to be critical readers of digital resources and to know what makes a good digital resource. Um, especially when it's a resource that's in the language that they're learning. Um, so I think that was one thing that we that is important to me because since I started teaching from today, there are so many more resources, Duolingua and so many online dictionaries and translators and so many things. But um, I, I just kind of wanted to help them learn to be critical uh, readers of or, or receivers of those kind of resources too. We haven't mentioned that in our case that we have a... a heavy teaching load, doing this kind of activity gave us the opportunity to combine teaching and research. So it's uh -huh. fantastic because we are doing, we are working on our two passions and uh, just uh, with the same material. Yeah, that's a very important point. Um, and again, coming back to this idea about embedding open educational practices, 21st century skills. Your, your example of, you know, we know that they're going to be using online translators, Babelfish or whatever, um, but they have to be shown explicitly in the materials or through your teaching what the limitations of those translators are and what the alternatives to those translators are. Just as you mentioned, um, it's, it would be better for them to go to word reference, and here is how you use word reference. So you can build all that right into your lessons in, themselves. That's just so great. Okay, we have a couple questions. Uh, Carl, I see there's a question about um, someone being conflicted about writing curriculum this summer. 
and also in the middle of a textbook adoption process. And I, I have some advice on that. Um, I really think <clears throat> that you have to go with your gut and you have to decide what your objectives are for your students, what you would like them to be able to do, what you're setting out to do. And then um, once you've established that and you've you have a game plan. You you know what you um, you know want them to accomplish. Then I think you can decide. Okay, from here, will a textbook support that? Do I? And you know you can research. Has a textbook been supportive of that, or would a textbook be supportive of that? And if it if it doesn't, then please don't change your curriculum to fit the mold of a textbook. I think uh, far too often people do that. There's just such a plethora of information out there with OER that makes um, you know your curriculum just so much stronger, so much better, and, and really on the best track for kids. So I think that that's the best advice I could give. And finally, um, we have time for one question. This question comes from Tracy, and she says, she, well, it's her comment, but she says, I like that you teach students about good OER and copyright permissions. Um, both of you mentioned quickly in passing copyright. So a lot of people, I, I want to kind of get the speaker's reactions to this. A lot of people are, are, you know, a little bit nervous to jump on the OER bandwagon because they feel like they don't know much about copyright. What have you learned? I just, if you could say a couple of words, what, what are some of the issues that you've encountered about copyright? We certainly still are novice, and so we are learning as we go, and um, we have a wonderful um, innovation team in our district that helps us navigate those uh, tricky situations, and we have just learned that, you know, we, we take it and we tweak it and we make it our own, and as long as we're using it for educational use in our classroom, we try to be very careful with that, walking a fine line. Um, as educators, not to step on anyone's toes for um, copyright, you know, and we do, we even teach our kids that here from seventh grade on, you know, citing resources, making sure that they know um, how to, um, uh, what's the word, discriminate against a good resource and a bad resource. We, we're doing that. I know that the ladies at um, George Mason said the same thing. We, we're doing the same, you know, at, in secondary education at a very early age. So hopefully by the time they get to them, <laughs> they can, um, you know, differentiate a good, a, a, a good resource and a bad resource. Also, the, you and your team did a great job at the workshop of this summer, last summer that I attended. So it was just two days, but I think I, what I learned using OER uh, specifically uh -huh. for heritage, uh, my heritage uh, in classes, but anyways, it's applied, it applies for all classes. I think it was enough to have a clear idea what is open and uh, what the restrictions are. And uh, so I appreciate that. And, and I came here and I shared all what I learned um, there. That's great. That's a wonderful story. That's wonderful to hear. So I think you also said something uh, important, and that is you, you may be a novice, but that doesn't mean that you have to stop and wait until you become an expert. You can mm -hmm. still create, and a little bit of knowledge can go a long way. So, And if you do have a question, there are plenty of people in the open education movement, uh, either at Creative Commons or here at Coral, who will help you answer those questions as they arise, because there are lots of contexts. There are so many contexts that, that, that we kind of take them as they come. So um, I want to thank everybody, but I uh, for for your stories and and um, I, I, it's really quite inspiring that you're actually doing what we've been talking about here at Coral, and I want us to end now by um, asking you to fill out a quick survey. It's actually very important for us because, as I said at the out, at the beginning, we are federally funded, and as part of our uh, the the regulations of the federal government, we have to show them who attended and what they felt. And so if we could just ask you for um, a couple of minutes to fill it out, it's really very brief. So thanks again to the speakers. Thank you all, all of our Thank participants. You. We had a really about 39, 40 participants, great crowd. And please fill out our survey. And um, come to visit our website, Coral, 
and you're going to find more information about much of the um, issues and the ideas that were talked about today. Thank you very much. Thank you so Great, much thank you. for inviting us. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.